Throughout the 90s, the Scream franchise shot to popularity with its self-reflexive storytelling and meta-humor by placing its characters within a horror-obsessed society. This gave way to countless references to slasher icons like Michael, Jason, and Freddy, as well as parallels drawn to films such as Psycho and When a Stranger Calls, generating a commentary on how they had evolved over time. However, with 11 years separating it from the original trilogy, Scream 4 places us in a world where the genre has shifted once again. The 90s teen slasher craze had run its course with countless sequels, torture porn had titillated audiences, and the remake trend was on the rise, offering us a slew of new movies to be referenced. So exactly how many are we talking about here? Well, keep watching to find out, because in this video, we'll be going over every single horror movie reference that can be found in Scream 4. What is up Scream Team, Zach Cherry here, and if you're as obsessed with horror movies as I am, you might want to consider hitting that subscribe button and turning on those bell notifications, setting them to all. That way, you can stay up to date with all my latest content. Before we get into the horror movie references, I want to thank NordVPN for sponsoring this video. NordVPN offers the best online virtual private network service for speed and security, allowing you to safely access your information with ease of use with over 5,100 servers in 60 countries across the globe. Just like Ghostface, keeping our identity a secret is the most important thing. With with NordVPN's advanced features and next generation technology, you can add an extra layer of security by routing your internet traffic through two servers instead of one, encrypting your data twice. This will prevent hackers, or in some cases pesky tabloid journalists, from gaining access to your personal information and allowing you peace of mind while you enjoy your online privacy. You can also use NordVPN to mask your IP and unlock geo-blocked content to gain access to your favorite scary movies that aren't otherwise available to stream in your region. Get started with NordVPN today by going to nordvpn.com slash ZachCherry or follow the link in the description below to get 73% off a two-year plan. Plus, you'll receive one additional month completely free. Having said all that, I've counted a total of 65 horror movies that have been referenced in Scream 4. As always, I would appreciate if you could toss this video a thumbs up and of course, let me know in the comments down below any other horror movie references you think I might have missed. Let's get into it. Just like with the reference guides for Screams 2 and 3, it should come as no surprise by this point that the 1996 original will automatically be included here. Not only for how paramount it's become to the mythology of Stab, the franchise within the franchise, but especially for the parallels between Casey Becker's opening scene and the one depicted here with Sherry and Trudy. We see this in the first shot with the phone being answered and other key moments like when Sherry slides the kitchen knife out of the wooden block and the killer ringing the doorbell from the front porch. We get our first non-in-franchise reference from Sherry when she declares that Saw 4 is the movie she's picked out for the night. Released in 2007, the fourth chapter in the Saw franchise depicts the continuing legacy of Jigsaw, a serial killer who places his victims in a series of intricate and deadly traps, forcing them to push past the bounds of human suffering in order to find new appreciation for life. Known to audiences for its extreme graphic violence, the series pioneered the torture porn subgenre in the post-postmodern era of horror, becoming the next big thing after the 90s teen slasher craze had run its course. However, not everybody's moved on from masked killers with knives as we find out after the fake out that Chloe is still very much into Ghostface and the Stab movies, citing them as being much scarier than aliens, zombies, and little Asian ghost girls. And while aliens and zombies cover a broad spectrum of titles, Little Asian Ghost Girls is most likely referring to 1998's Ringu, in which a reporter investigates a cursed videotape that kills its viewers seven days after watching it. When we jump past the second fake out, taking us into the movie proper, Jenny explains the concept of Stab 6 playing in Stab 7 as being like The Twilight Zone, a science fiction horror anthology show that originally aired in 1959. It also went on to receive a feature length movie in 1983, and since Jenny uses the phrase, it's like a movie within a movie, I'll go ahead and add both the television series and film to the board, just to cover all bases. I'll also add Screams 2 and 3 at this point, since this is the first mention we get of the original Stab trilogy, and although it won't be the last, it's here where Jenny explains how the first two sequels were about Sidney Prescott, until the franchise was forced to write new characters after she sued the studio in 
video for using her likeness. Apparently, Stab 5 involves time travel, which may be a reference to the fact that Wes Craven originally wanted that to be an element used in the story for A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, but since it never made its way to the finished film, we'll just consider that some fun bonus trivia. Also, Jenny mentions that Stab 5 is by far the worst, which could be a joke at the expense of the big horror franchises whose fifth entries are typically regarded by fans as being among the lowest rated. Now, if you happen to own Scream 4 on physical media, you might have seen the alternate opening in which the roles of the two girls are reversed. Originally, Jenny was to have been the first to get killed, giving Marnie just a slight head start to getting away from Ghostface. This is referenced in the theatrically released version of the film, where Ghostface calls Jenny and tells her that Marnie's part got cut way back, leaving her on the cutting room floor. Marnie is then thrown through the patio doors, which is not only a callback to the original Scream, but also a well-worn cliche that we would see time and again throughout the Friday the 13th franchise, and since we are going to see that movie come up several times on this list, I'll just go ahead and add it to the board now. We also get a possible reference to Friday the 13th Part 3 during the alternate opening, where after getting tired of Jenny's continuous pranks, Marty becomes incredulous towards her screams of bloody murder as she's actually being stabbed to death by Ghostface. This crywolf scenario is similar in nature to the character of Shelly, who after pranking his friend friends all day, even faking his own death at one point, is ignored when he finally does get his throat slashed for real, left to bleed out on the kitchen floor while the other characters remain oblivious to the threat outside. We also get one more callback to the original Scream during the final cut of the film's opening, where Jenny attempts to crawl out of the garage only for Ghostface to close the door on her spine. Although not copied exactly, this would be the second time the killer would weaponize a garage door opener. Our next reference comes from Olivia, as she she, Jill, and Kirby drive to school. Referring to Sydney as the Angel of Death, Olivia states that Stab is the wrong franchise for Sydney to be a final girl in, as she's much more well suited to Final Destination, seeing as how she always survived while everyone else around her died. Popular throughout the 2000s, each Final Destination film begins with a horrific event, which is subsequently survived by a small group of people who cheat death after one member receives a premonition, warning the others right beforehand. The survivors are then stalked by a supernatural force which picks each one off one by one in a series of bizarre freak accidents. There are currently five entries in the series, however, since the last installment hadn't come out yet by the time of Scream 4's release, I'll just add the first four films, which were chronologically released in the years 2000, 2003, 2006, and 2009. We're then introduced to Deputy Judy Hicks, who apparently went to the Lee Brackett Academy for policing, since just like Haddonfield's resident sheriff, she She's just as quick to blame everything on kids, and as John Carpenter's 1978 Halloween has been a continuous source of inspiration for the Scream franchise, we'll go ahead and add that to the list too, as this is far from the last time it'll show up during the movie. There's another reference to the first three Screams when we get a peek at the novels on Gail's desk, and while we were already familiar with the Woodsboro murders based on the original movie, this is the first time we see its follow-up books, with College Terror based on Scream 2 and and Hollywood Horror based on Scream 3. It's at this point where there exists a deleted scene where we would have gotten not only a cameo appearance from director Wes Craven playing the Woodsboro County Coroner, but also a callback to the original when Jenny and Marnie's corpses would have been discovered by the police, posed to resemble the way both Casey Becker and Steve Orth were found at the beginning of the first movie. The killers also leave the proverbial ghost face catchphrase, what's your favorite scary movie, written on the wall in blood. Speaking of favorite scary movies, Kirby cites hers as being Bambi. And no, we're not adding the treasured Disney classic to the reference guide, however, this sarcastic offbeat answer does evoke memories of a certain horror geek's response in Scream 2. Showgirls. Absolutely frightening. In the finished film, we get a brief profile glimpse of an ornamental bust in the school hallway, which in an extended moment that was cut from the film, we see a little more detail, revealing it to be a memorial to the late Principal Arthur Hembry, who was the third on-screen victim of the original Scream. Later on at the book signing, after Dewey commandeers the event, Sidney's publicist Rebecca refers to him as Barney Fife, a moniker that had previously been given to him in Gale's first book, as mentioned by Dewey himself in 
in Scream 2. Rebecca also makes reference to Stab 3, pointing out the real-life parallels between Gale and Dewey's 10-year marriage, meaning that their characters also got engaged at the end of the third stab. Following the interview at the police station, another deleted scene finds all the teens, minus Jill, wait around by the water fountain where they ponder why the killer would be calling her. I mean, she's in his cousin, blood relations. The Grudge, Amityville Horror, Cape Fear, Halloween. Uh, I'm gonna have to call Robbie out for this being the most nonsensical slew of references we've had in the series to date. While Cape Fear does depict an ex-con seeking revenge on the family of the lawyer responsible for his eight-year-long incarceration, neither The Grudge nor the Amityville Horror have anything to do with past generational sins coming back to haunt a present lineage, as they instead involve families moving into houses that are either cursed or haunted. Further to that, Amityville removes any sort of blood relation altogether, as it's well established that the patriarch of the family is the children's stepfather, and as far as Halloween is concerned, we should all know by this point that the revelation of Michael Myers' blood relation to Lori Strode didn't actually show up until the sequel. So yeah, maybe get your facts straight, dude. At least Kirby is a little sharper, as she goes on to mention that Sydney is just as expendable as everybody else, with Charlie citing Ripley's death in Alien 3, as well as Lori's death in Halloween Resurrection as notable examples. Robbie and Charlie then attempt and fail completely to mimic the theme from 1973's The Exorcist, as well as Harry Manfredini's score from Friday the 13th. <laughs> Seriously, how are these guys in charge of the cinema club? Later that night, when Dewey pays a visit to the Roberts residence, he reminds us all once again that he is able to read, quoting a passage from Sidney's book with the corresponding page number, which was a skill he was all too eager to show off in Scream 2. We then get a reference to an American werewolf in London, courtesy of a poster on Jill's bedroom door. Released in 1981, the film follows two tourists who are attacked by a werewolf while trekking across the moors of Yorkshire. While one of them is killed, the other is bitten and taken back to London to recover, where he transforms into the beast and unwittingly wreaks havoc upon the city. I will point out that from this point on, a lot of the horror movie references in Scream 4 are primarily going to be found in the movie set dressings, as it seems that the art department had a field day when decorating various scenes with old horror movie posters. Something that makes my job way more difficult here, since I now have to account for every surface detail of each scene, but it also gives this sequel an exponentially greater amount of callbacks and easter eggs, so bear with me as this is only the tip of the iceberg. Also not used sparingly here are the ubiquitous callbacks to the original Scream, as Trevor enters and exits Jill's bedroom bedroom window, just the same as Billy did, triggering an old memory for Sydney. We also have the inclusion of a storyline that was ultimately nixed from Scream 3, which has now been repurposed using the character of Deputy Hicks. Originally, Angelina was revealed to be Roman's accomplice and the second Ghostface killer, where Sydney would have been reminded that she had previously known her from high school as a classmate who had an unhealthy obsession with her. This is similar to Sydney's reunion with Judy, where she doesn't quite recognize her at first until the deputy informs her that they were in the drama club together where she had idolized Sydney, who always got the best parts in the school plays. This also acts as a callback to remind us that Sydney did at one time aspire to be an actress. We then get a visual reference to Shaun of the Dead, Edgar Wright's 2004 horror comedy, spoofing the redefined zombie zeitgeist of the early 2000s. We can also see next to its DVD case that Jill owns a copy of The Breed, a 2006 film about a group of friends who who are besieged by a pack of ravenous, genetically enhanced dogs while vacationing on a deserted island. There's also a copy of Zodiac Unmasked on her bookshelf, Robert Graysmith's follow-up to his 1986 novel about the real-life Zodiac killer, which features the same cover art from its 2007 film adaptation. And if you needed any more evidence that Jill was a serial killer in the making, here's another copy of Gail Weathers' College Terror based on Scream 2. Interestingly enough, Kevin Williamson recently revealed what his plan for Scream 5 would have been had Jill gotten away with everything here like he had originally written. The film would have used a similar backdrop of Scream 2's college campus as its template, featuring Jill going off to school where she would then be stalked by a brand new serial killer who would have already been aware of her secret. Now, next up is Olivia's big death scene, which in and of itself pays homage to at least three different horror films, one of which that had previously been directed by Wes Craven himself. And if you're wondering which one that might be, 
movie, look no further than 1984's A Nightmare on Elm Street, specifically the scene where Johnny Depp's character Glenn is murdered in his sleep by Fred Krueger. Helpless to do anything, Nancy Thompson is forced to watch from out her bedroom window as her boyfriend is pulverized into a geyser of blood in the house just across the way. More aptly, however, this death scene acts as an homage to Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window. Released in 1954, the film follows a wheelchair-bound photographer whose pastime while recovering from his broken leg involves spying on his neighbors from his apartment's courtyard window. It's here where he witnesses one of them murder their wife and dispose of the body, inciting him to launch his own investigation into the crime with the help of his fashion model girlfriend played by Grace Kelly. And lastly, we also have Dario Argento's Deep Red. Released in 1975, the Italian giallo kicks off with a parapsychology conference in which a world-renowned psychic uncovers a 20-year-old murder when she reads the thoughts of the theater audience. In order to keep the crime a secret, the murderer follows her home that evening where they bludgeon her to death with a hatchet, only to have a neighbor witness the event in a similar composition to the shot of Olivia getting pushed through her window. Next up, in a bit that was ultimately photoshopped out of the film, Sydney originally discovers Olivia's body with a pet doorframe around her neck as a direct homage to Tatum's kill and scream. A subsequent scene was also removed in which Dewey and Hicks discuss the correlation, which probably explains why this shot was digitally altered for the final movie as it's not very clear as to what that is without the explanatory dialogue that comes afterwards. Also, just like Derek in Scream 2, Jill comes running inside only for Ghostface to slash her arm in the exact same place. However, unlike Scream 2, where this acted as a plot device to draw more suspicion onto Derek, it's instead used here to remove all suspicion from Jill entirely. Later on at the hospital, we see Sydney exit an examination room with a doctor who tells her to take a couple of weeks off. It's unknown whether or not an additional scene was filmed here, but in an early draft of the script, we learn that the doctor in question is actually the older brother of Steve Orth, Casey Becker's boyfriend and the first proper kill of the original movie. I'm assuming the scene was cut for time, but it seems like one more of many huge missed opportunities in Scream 4, as this would have offered a very human moment for Sydney, as she connected with another person over the grief of a shared tragedy from her past. It also would have given more context to her decision to fire Rebecca, whose subsequent death is a possible reference to The Omen. Released in 1976, the film depicts an American ambassador living in Rome who secretly adopts a baby after he and his wife lose their own son during childbirth. Five years later, a plague of mysterious deaths surround the family, leading the parents to believe the boy is in fact the Antichrist. In a similar death scene from that movie, a character is thrown out of a hospital window where they crash through an ambulance on the street level below, not unlike Rebecca's body being thrown onto a news van from above. As far as the rest of the hospital scenes are concerned, there isn't really any references beyond that, at least from what I can tell, but this will bring us to Cinema Club the next day, which basically offers up a smorgasbord of horror movie references in the form of posters that can be found lining the classroom walls. First up is Wes Craven's original The Hills Have Eyes, Feast, Wolf Creek, which is also represented separately here by its tagline, and then a partial tagline from the poster for Rob Zombie's Halloween. Of course, we've got the poster for Stab, George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead, Rob Zombie's remake sequel Halloween 2, and John Carpenter's The Thing. We've also got a poster for Stab 3, Stab 5, Army of Darkness, Critters 2, Death Proof, and Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, then Wes Craven's The People Under the Stairs, Stab 6, and Blood Simple. There are obviously way more posters used in this scene, a lot of which are not even horror specific, but they're not entirely legible, so if anyone who has a good eye for this sort of thing wants to participate, I challenge you to name a few others to add to the lot. Until then, all these movies should be enough to pad the reference chart quite nicely, as it gives us 13 new titles to add in total. This scene also showcases a whiteboard display detailing the previously mentioned rear window, plus Robbie name drops Jamie Lee Curtis and Linda Blair when comparing Sydney's star power to the legendary Scream Queens. Linda Blair, obviously from The Exorcist, also made a cameo appearance in the original Scream as the annoying reporter who accosts Sydney outside of school. Later on at the Stabathon, many of the guests in attendance are outfitted to represent key characters characters such as Dewey, Gale, and Casey, and we even see from some of the party decorations that references are being made to both Casey and Tatum's death scenes from the first movie. Also similar to the first movie,
movie, Gale plans to hide several hidden cameras all over the barn in hopes of catching the killer in the act, but just as Sidney and Kenny had watched Ghostface sneak up behind an oblivious Randy, Dewey watches the monitors helplessly as Gale also comes within an inch of her life. Back at the Roberts residence, we get to spend a little bit more time with the two deputies assigned to protect Sydney, and as we've seen in the past, those characters aren't usually too long for this world. Interestingly, while Scream 2's Officer Richards and Andrews were named homages to the child actors who played Lindsay and Tommy in Halloween, Ross Haas doesn't call to mind any horror references that I've ever heard of. His partner Anthony Perkins, however, is a very not-so-subtle reference to the actor who played Norman Bates in all four original Psycho movies. And while the character's demise here is reportedly a horror movie first, after Wes Craven was inspired by seeing a similar injury on an emergency room documentary, we're given a pretty solid Michael Myers reference as Ghostface copies the killer's all-too-well-known trademark head tilt. After this, Sydney receives a phone call from the killer, echoing two similar beats from Scream 3. First, when she's instructed to turn on the news to watch the aftermath of the latest carnage, and then later on, after she's lured out into a trap at the threat of certain harm coming to her loved ones. As we even see right after this, Kate is stabbed to death by Ghostface, creating another parallel between Sydney and Jill, as now both of their mothers have been killed by a serial killer. And beyond this being a callback to Maureen Prescott's death, the kill is somewhat evocative of Phil's demise in Scream 2, as similar to him getting stabbed through a bathroom stall partition, Kate is stabbed while pressing up against a mailbox slot. Over at Kirby's house, Charlie arrives with Robbie, where he takes notice of the extensive horror collection, calling attention to two specific titles. The first one, Suspiria, is a 1977 Italian supernatural horror film in which an American ballet student discovers that the dance school she's just enrolled in is run by a powerful coven of witches. Directed by Dario Argento, the opening scene murder was even referenced in the original Scream upon the discovery of Casey Becker's body hanging from the tree. The second film is the 1973 mystery thriller Don't Look Now, in which a married couple grieving the recent death of their daughter encounter a psychic who brings them a warning from beyond the grave. Charlie then quizzes Kirby on her knowledge of horror movies by asking her who played Leatherface first, to which she correctly answers Gunnar Hansen. Known primarily as the main antagonist of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the 1973 film finds the iconic killer prey upon a group of kids after they venture onto his rural property during a summer road trip. In another reference to the original Scream, as well as being a clue to the ultimate roles the characters will be playing, Trevor and Jill are dressed up very similar similarly to both Neil Prescott and Billy Loomis, respectively, with Trevor even being tied up and locked in the kitchen pantry, while Jill is later revealed to be the killer. After Sydney arrives and Ghostface chases her and Jill up into Kirby's room, we notice posters on the bedroom walls for Tremors, Nosferatu, and the already mentioned rear window. So we'll go ahead and add those, as well as a possible reference to Halloween, as Sydney seems to be channeling her inner Laurie Strode here. Get out of bed. What? Just do what I say. Get out of bed. Don't do as I say. After Sydney eludes Ghostface on the roof, she goes back inside the house where she and Kirby hide in the basement. They witness Charlie seemingly getting attacked by the walkout entrance where after the outdoor lights turn off and then on again, we see Charlie gagged and bound to a patio chair in an obvious reference to the very first scene of the very first movie. Ghostface even calls Kirby on her cell to play a game of trivia, which will commence the largest portion of this movie's references as well as maybe the most memorable scene of a character listing off their knowledge of the horror genre throughout the entire Scream franchise. First up, Kirby is asked to name Jason's weapon, which she correctly answers as a machete, and as we should all know from the first Scream by now, Jason didn't show up as the killer until Friday the 13th Part 2, where he did indeed first use his trademark blade, so I'll make sure to add that to the list. Kirby also correctly answers a chainsaw as the weapon of choice belonging to Leatherface, which would be embarrassing if she got wrong, as they were literally just talking about it a few minutes earlier. However, this ghost face is deceitfully forgiving when it comes to partially incorrect answers, as they let it slide when Kirby states that Michael Myers' weapon of choice is a butcher knife. 
As it's been commonly mistaken and often corrected by knife purists, Michael uses a kitchen knife, also known as a chef knife, while a butcher knife is actually another term for a cleaver. As for Kirby referring to Freddy Krueger's weapon as razor hands, perhaps it would be a bit too pedantic to not consider that an alternative way of saying razor gloves. However, she should not have pluralized it, as Freddy has only ever been shown to have the one glove, which he wears on his right hand. Ghostface then asks Kirby to name the movie that started the slasher craze, offering a multiple choice of answers, including the already established Halloween 1978 and Texas Chainsaw Massacre 1973, as well as Wes Craven's very own directorial debut Last House on the Left from 1972 and Alfred Hitchcock's seminal classic Psycho from 1960. Kirby guesses Psycho, which we then find out was a wrong answer as Ghostface had designed it to be a trick question, citing Peeping Tom as the correct movie. Released just a few months prior to Psycho, the British psychological horror thriller follows a serial killer who murders women while recording their deaths with a portable film camera. As explained by Ghostface here, the movie has the distinction of originating the POV shot of the killer, which is often incorrectly credited to John Carpenter for Halloween and, to a lesser extent, Bob Clark for the earlier released Black Christmas. Ghostface allows Kirby one last chance bonus round, appropriately themed around the horror remake trend which had saturated the genre throughout the 2000s. However, we never get to hear the full question as Kirby overzealously begins to list off nearly every single one of them, including Rob Zombie's Halloween, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Dawn of the Dead, The Hills Have Eyes, Amityville Horror, Last House on the Left, Friday the 13th, A Nightmare on Elm Street, My Bloody Valentine, When a Stranger Calls, Prom Night, Black Christmas, House of Wax, The Fog, and Piranha. There's still quite a few more references to be found throughout the climax of the movie, like this poster in Kirby's bedroom for the creature from the Black Lagoon. And my apologies for not including this on the chart of all the other movie posters, but this was a very last minute inclusion as I didn't actually notice it until I was 90% finished editing and had already created the animation. So yeah, there's actually 66 horror movies referenced here. This then leads us to the reveals of both Charlie and Jill as the killers, where, although subverted here, it initially seems that the two are going to stab each other to make it appear as though they were victims themselves, just as Billy and Stu had attempted. However, in more of a callback to Scream 2, Jill instead betrays Charlie, just as Mrs. Loomis had to Mickey, done here instead by stabbing him in the heart. We get another callback to Scream 2 as Jill is being carted off to the hospital, where reporters ask her how it feels to be a hero. This is a line that was spoken verbatim after Sydney survived the Windsor College Massacre. The major difference being that while Sidney passed the torch over to Cotton Weary, declaring him as the true hero, Jill is more than content with keeping all of the glory for herself, as she basks in the media attention after finally achieving her murderous goal. As she recovers in her hospital bed after having surgery, we do get another possible reference to The Exorcist, as Jill does slightly resemble a possessed Reagan McNeil. You know, sans the throw up. We even get another reference to Michael Myers when Jill names him directly in correlation to Sydney's glaring plot armor that seems to keep her coming back sequel after sequel. We also get another meta reference as Sydney suggests that her survival, as well as Jill's foiled plans, are a direct result of this being an alternate ending. True to the fact, Kevin Williamson's script did originally end back at Kirby's house, with Jill getting ready for her big moment in front of the cameras while Sydney Spade is left hanging in the balance. Dissatisfied with leaving Scream 4 on a cliffhanger, producers added a new ending, which is the one we've all come to know. And if it evokes memories of another 2000s horror movie, that's because it's a plot ripped right out of the Black Christmas remake. Despite the fact that the original holiday-themed slasher had always ended at the sorority, this iteration finds final girl Kelly taken to the hospital after surviving Billy and Agnes's killing spree, only for the sibling psychopaths to follow her there to wreak just a little bit more murder and mayhem. And finally, as one more reference to Scream 3, we're reminded of that film's finale when Deputy Judy reveals that she's also survived a gunshot by wearing a concealed bulletproof vest. Does that mean she thinks like a killer? I don't know. Stay tuned for Scream 5 to find out. But there you have it. Every horror movie reference made in Scream 4.
If you guys haven't done so already, you can check out my reference guides for the first three Scream movies or find out which killer was behind the mask for every murder. Just click on any of these playlists. Until then, I've been Zach Cherry and I'll be right back.